de Cognitoc euh, qui va présenter Rémi. Okay. Uh, bonsoir. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't quite listen to what you were saying, so um, hope, hopefully, I, hopefully I don't uh, repeat what you just said. So I think we have a, a great program tonight. Uh, we have two things that we're going to go on. Je vais juste dire que nos invités sont italiens, donc ils vont parler anglais parce que on a pensé que c'est mieux que que, que, que l'italien. Donc voilà. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that. So it's going to be uh, in English tonight. Hopefully you're fine with that. Um, so we have two things going on tonight. The f in the first part, uh, about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we have uh, Remy with us. Um, as c can we project to the screen? Uh, Remy is uh, Remy Coulon is the author of uh, Crazy Stone, which is a software uh, that's playing Go. So it's an artificial intelligence software that's playing Go, and until very recently, it has that's been the the best Go playing program in the world. Uh, so Remy has given a talk in Nantes in December, last December, and we were very very happy to have him here, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, you probably, or at least some of you, have seen that recently there was a, a lot of things going on in, in the game of Go. Uh, there is uh, uh, an American company called Google who has a branch in London, uh, and they have worked on, on Go, and they have uh, put out a, a very interesting piece of software as well, and that has beaten uh, re very recently Uh, the European Go Master, and which next week on the 9th will start a championship with the with one of the uh, best Go playing humans in this on this planet, which is uh, Lisa Dahl. And so it's uh, one of these turning points in the history of AI where we see whether machines can actually surpass humans. We've seen that in 97 with uh, Kasparov, who played uh, Deep Blue from IBM and uh, who lost. Uh, so maybe we're going to uh, see something else on the Go side of things in the next week. So it's a, it's a very challenging and a very interesting point in time uh, uh, in the history of artificial intelligence. And uh, Remy was playing a very important role over the last years, not only as the holder of the, uh, the best program, but also of being very instrumental in that community and of uh, participating in many competitions and things like that. So. Uh, Bonsoir, Rémi. Um, Bonsoir. I don't know whether you want to talk English or French. Uh, I think both are fine. We have two people here in the room who definitely don't speak French. So, uh, oh, yeah, I can speak English. Okay, so if you want to do this in English, that would be great. Uh, so uh, maybe um, you can comment a little bit of what's going on, your personal perspective on this, and, uh, and what you think is going to happen next week, and so on and so forth. I, I leave it up to you. Like 15 minutes or so would be great. Thanks. Yeah, so... Uh, when the Nature paper was published, I was uh, surprised. In fact, I was especially surprised since uh, the programmer of AlphaGo is my former student, and he did not tell me anything about what was going on. And so, uh, when I visited you in Nantes uh, in uh, a few months ago, I concluded my talk by saying that uh, deep learning was a promising. Uh, research direction and it turned out I was right but unfortunately I'm a bit late behind them and so yes what can I say so yes next week they will play a match so I believe if they play the match is because they expect that they have good chance to win it's difficult to predict I hope that they will lose but uh, unfortunately I, I uh, Yeah, it's likely they will win, in my, in my opinion, but we will see. And um, yes, so what can I tell? So yes, so since they, they published the paper in Nature, I'm, I'm working very hard to improve Crazy Stone. I was already working on deep learning a few months ago, but now everybody is working very hard on deep learning. So uh, in um, two weeks, I will go to Japan for the UEC Cup. And it will be a big tournament with all the computer Go people. Well, except Google, unfortunately. But yeah, we are not strong enough for them. 
And uh, so Facebook will participate in this tournament. So it would be a nice event. Yes, and so uh, yeah, it would be very exciting to talk about all the other co-programmers. And yes, I don't know what else to say. Do you have questions? Uh, maybe you can comment on why um, why Go is so difficult for computer programs. And uh, I mean, as you just said, in December you predicted that it will take still quite some time until a uh, computer can actually beat a, uh, uh, one of the grandmasters in Go. Uh, why do you think this is evolving so fast now? What is what is happening actually? What what's going what's on? What's happening is the, the yes. What's happening is that deep learning is surprisingly successful, and it's really shocking how work how well it works. And um, uh, yes, and so in the beginning, I underestimated deep learning uh, a lot because I had my own pattern learning system, and yes. It, it turned out, yes, deep learning. So you have to use a very big network and train it for very long. I think that's one of the big keys of the success of Google is they are, they have huge computational power. And uh, so if you use a small network and train it for a small period of time, it will not be very strong. But if you have a very big network and train it with 50, they, I think they use 50 GPUs for uh, two months or something like this then it can yeah become very strong so i think uh, yes most of us well we knew that deep learning was promising but we did not expect it would be that uh, effective yeah okay so uh, uh I, I understand that uh, this is uh, this came as a surprise i mean i think we were all surprised i remember our discussions last year and actually while we discussed they had already uh, performed that competition against the European Grandmaster, and so they already knew we didn't. Um, so um, if you look at this, um, I, mean, I know that you are actively working on implementing your own version of deep learning. Um, how important do you think is, is to train the neural networks on supervised uh, data, so you know, taking existing games uh, that were uh, uh, recorded and then you present the data to the network and have it learn that versus which is Demis Hazabi is, is very much insisting on that versus uh, self uh, playing neural networks so the ne your net neural network trained initially and then it plays against itself becoming better all the time any 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 idea of how important that is Oh, sorry, I did not understand the question. Uh, the the question is, you know, how important is self-learning uh, or, or self-playing? So the, they they initially train the neural network on 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 some on some existing games, mm. and uh, once it's uh, it's bootstrapped that way, and then they continue to train the neural network, but the next actually the neural network plays against itself. Yes. Uh, so and then then they apply reinforcement learning. Any comment on that? I did not understand. I understood everything except the question. Uh, oh, so, uh, whether you have any comment on this? I'm oh, sorry. Comments? Uh, yes. So that's. I think the the really big originality of their paper is um, the fact that they train a value network, because in the past we use machine learning in uh, Go, but only to learn a policy, that to say a distribution probability of all legal moves that we use to shape the search tree or to. Uh, choose moves in the random playouts. And what they did and what is very original, well, it's not so very original because um, in the 90s, there was a lot of research about using neural network to learn a value function for the game of Go. There was, in particular, a program called NeuroGo by Marcus Entenberger that was successful at that time. But uh, they were using extremely small neural network and they trained it with little data and it was very weak. And I think, yes, that's, that's the most, uh, I think the most uh, exciting idea in their paper is that they actually managed to learn a value function. That is to say, take a board as input and give as output, not a move, but an evaluation of the position. And um, uh -huh. yes, and that's, really, that's a really interesting novelty compared to what we were doing with Monte Carlo research. Right. And, yeah. 
Okay, and one ahead. really, one, something that really shocked me is in this paper is that even without Monte Carlo search, that is to say, if they use um, the, the, the grow tree and just evaluate the leaves of the tree with their um, value network without running random playouts to the end of the game, they still manage to have a very strong program. And that's, uh, yeah, that really surprised me. Yeah. Okay. Um any other comments that you would like to make you know how 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 impactful this is what's going on you know on the rest of game ai i mean you are not only programming go but you're also involved in chess and other games yeah you well, think the games, this yes, is a turning yes. point so i think go is really the perfect match for uh, deep learning because uh, it's a matter of pattern recognition and so we have a board as input a board as output and of course, similar techniques can be applied to chess. Well, recently there was some paper published about applying deep learning to chess, but uh, it's not so su successful. The, the really um, yeah, particular aspect of Go is that yeah, convolutions really make sense in Go because this neighborhood around every uh, stone is very significant. And for games of such as chess, it's, the convolution makes much less sense, so it's more difficult. So, but there are other games that look a bit like Go, but are not very well known, like uh, the game of Hex. And I'm quite sure that the techniques that work for the game of Go will work for the game of Hex. I don't know if you know it, but it's not very well known. And yes, so outside Go, I don't know. Okay. But, uh, yes, it's like, you know, deep learning is so powerful. It's, um, yeah, killing every problem everywhere. It will kill more problems for sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have two, two more for you, two, two more questions. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, will we see in the um, near or distant future, will we see a uh, competition of any sort where Crazy Stone plays against AlphaGo? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so there, there is this UC Cup, but they are not participating. So I don't know, but it will not be very interesting. You know, they, they uh, right now they would crush Crazy Stone very easily. In, in their paper, they won, uh, I don't know how many, 500 games to zero or something. I don't remember the, the numbers. Yeah, but uh, you're working on it and you're improving it. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> No well, pressure I've been, here. I've been working very hard in the last month, and I'm making good progress. But uh, I, I cannot compete with the hardware. And yes, my progress is so. I I, I decided to develop my own uh, homemade uh, deep learning library. So it took me a lot of time. It's uh, maybe a bit bold decision, but I'm really happy with this because I'm learning a lot with uh, GPU programming and everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's. I've just started to work recently, and I'm really excited by the performance of what I get. And so I think it will take me maybe a few months to become very strong. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that, and we are looking forward. I mean, we were kind of proud to have the uh, holder of the uh, you know the strongest Go playing uh, software here in France, and uh, we would like to win that back. So uh, <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> oh, our thoughts are with you. Uh, my last question is, uh, like everybody else, uh, there are, if you look on the web, there are uh, lots of websites that try to make predictions or ask people to give their opinion on who's going to win next week. What's your, uh, what's your score or what's your, uh, what's your thought on this? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Uh, uh, yeah. If I had to bet my money, I would say Google will win. Okay, so yeah. I, I looked at some of those websites that had, and I'm actually, uh, you know, trying to, to collect uh, opinions, and it's pretty uh, much 50 50 right now. Some I, websites are 60 40. Uh, it's a tricky question. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, we don't know. I mean, <laughs> actually, Lisa Dahl was asked what, what he thinks, and he said that he is pretty confident that he will win. So uh, we'll see yeah. what, what's going on next week. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions here in the, in the audience? Nope. Okay. Thanks, Remy. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Goodbye. So wait, Remy, bef before you go, this is Jeff 
talking. Um, how, just to get an idea of what advantage Google and Facebook have in this, how much would it cost you to, so, so the hardware that they use, you can probably rent on AWS or something like that. How much would it cost you to, uh, to do uh, this if, if know, it were just lot, money? So I'm already spending quite a lot of money this day on uh, Amazon uh, servers. And <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to estimate because in the paper they describe, they describe the, the experiment that works. But uh, in order to, <laughs> to do something that works, you have to try hundreds of things that don't work. And I expect that uh, uh, the, the amount of computation they use to produce AlphaGo is worth uh, around $1 million. It's not affordable for me. Yeah. I have yeah. to use clever algorithms instead. Yeah. Right. Good. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I, I cannot hear anything. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We, I think we have a connection. We just had a connection problem. Thanks, Remy, for being with us tonight. Uh, it was Thank great. You. Thank you. I will connect soon uh, by email again and let you go. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye for tonight. Bye. Okay. So glad that this uh, Skype did actually work out. That's not always obvious. Alrighty. So uh, that was the first part. Um, and I think it was kind of fun to hear Remy uh, talk about reality after a few months that he had talked to us about the future. <laughs> because uh, the, the future came much faster than anybody expected, so that's kind of fun. Um, the second part tonight is, uh, as Jeff had uh, introduced, is, uh, is kind of uh, different. It's not about games, but it's very game-like, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Marco Gori. Marco is a professor at the University of Siena in computer science. He is a person that has been very long in the machine learning, AI, game AI as well, uh, community. He has a very long track record of very interesting things that he has done. And uh, tonight uh, he will talk uh, to us about uh, learning with and from constraints. So uh, I have had the immense pleasure over the last year to have, to have discussions with him on this topic uh, at various occasions, and I found it very fascinating. So I'm very happy to share this uh, with uh, the non meetup community tonight. Um, before I let, the, let the Marco uh, do his presentation, I just want to thank uh, the people from Epitech here again. Uh, that was uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a great, great room here. Thanks for having us, and thanks for the professional uh, equipment and services. And I also want to thank Jeff, who usually doesn't get thanked because uh, he's the one who presents. So now that I'm presenting, thanks Jeff for putting all this together. I know it's, a, it's much more work than it looks like. Thanks. <laughs> okay, without any further ado, Marco Gori on learning with and from constraints. Okay, so um, of course, thanks a lot for the, for inviting me, uh, uh, for you know giving a talk here in in Nant. Of course, it's a, it's a nice opportunity of uh, exchanging idea, and especially uh, yeah, I would like uh, also at the end of the talk if you are curious and, and you want to make questions, I'm really very happy. Um, so, uh, it's interesting, before uh, starting to uh, present my talk, uh, uh, we have seen in the previous discussion the importance of machine learning. Everybody now is so, uh, uh, so happy with uh, uh, deep learning, this magic word. Um, and I have to tell you that um, um, uh, sometimes I'm really 
uh, a little bit embarrassed in, in seeing you know the outcome of uh, of deep learning you know the way uh, the impact that uh, we have seen on, on, on in, in a number of different problems in a nov- number of different contexts um, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I've seen this uh, this stuff many many years ago. Um, uh, I had the opportunity and the pleasure uh, to start uh, studying machine learning uh, exactly at the time in which one of the uh, you know the the leader nowadays in the field, uh, one of the people who has contributed more to promote uh, deep learning, Joshua Benjo, you know, was uh, we were doing essentially the PhD at the same time in McGill. Uh, many years, many many years ago, and uh, um, I have, a, have a, the pleasure of discussing with with, with Joshua uh, uh, more or less a couple of years ago, and I'm really uh, excited about you know this uh, big impact, and of course uh, it's something concrete, and uh, mm, but of course there is something that uh, I'd like to uh, pose. Uh, to your attention tonight uh, when talking about uh, machine learning and all the uh, challenging application. It has to do with, uh, you know, where is the value of uh, this kind of technologies, especially deep learning, whether, you know, the value is on something which is concretely new uh, from, a, you know, a, a computational model, from the perspective of a computational model, Or if on the opposite, you know, we are talking about very, very smart people who have been using in a very uh, professional way uh, computational resources that were not available many years ago. And of course, this is a very nice question, very important question, because uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, computational resources is definitely important. Uh, but maybe it's not the only reason. There are, you know, some important uh, new things. And of course, it's not the, the, the subject of the discussion tonight. But uh, uh, this is just to tell you that what you see here uh, and what I call learning from constraint is, uh, uh, you know, uh, our approach to uh, proposing learning in a, let's say, in a, in a different way uh, with respect to what we, we have been seeing at the moment. Uh, I mean, um, uh, in a different way, because uh, instead of uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the architecture, the algorithms uh, that are improving uh, what we saw many years ago, backpropagation-like algorithms, uh, I'm trying to do it, uh, something which uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's remarkably different. I want to see it's better uh, because at the moment uh, I have to uh, honestly have to say that uh, we have just, uh, you know, very preliminary results uh, in, in, from a, an experimental point of view. And this is a field in which until, uh, you know, uh, you need to reach some important achievement from an experimental point of view if you want to have your idea uh, really uh, supported. And so it's preliminary, even if it is published, even if, uh, you know, there is something that I think is already pretty well organized, it's preliminary uh, in terms of impact. Uh, but uh, anyway, I will do my best uh, to convey at least a few ideas. So there are many slides, but I will focus just on few, uh, just to convey the basic ideas. So uh, I will talk about, you know, what, what to me, what are constraints and what is the typical, what is the typical uh, uh, life of the, the intelligent agents I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the environment and I'm thinking about the life of those agents in, uh, in their environment. And uh, I'm proposing this notion of constraint, uh, which is of course nothing new in artificial intelligence. It is a, it is a new, I would say, uh, once you propose the uh, this kind of, of context. And the focus will be on learning. So what is the meaning of learning from constraints? Uh, we'll see that it's a sort of new protocol. Uh, you know for sure what is supervised learning, what is unsupervised learning, what is semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning. It's something new uh, uh, with respect to this kind of uh, uh, classical framework. I will propose a few case uh, studies and then at the end, I will focus attention on what is, uh, you know, uh, at the moment, which is capturing my attention, at least in the last couple of years. 
So what I write here, uh, developmental uh, learning, uh, because it, it is what, what I like most. But uh, in order to talk quickly at the end of, of my discussion of developmental learning, uh, I decided to uh, talk before of uh, my efforts in uh, uh, discussing what uh, you know, learning from constraint is. Um, so, um, uh, what is learning from constraint? L let me give you an example. Th this is classical supervised learning. So, everybody here know that uh, you may give some target uh, and then you want to construct a, a function uh, which gets as close as possible to uh, a certain target. So, uh, this is supervised learning. You have to provide a lot of labeled data, but uh, if you think in terms of, uh, from a pure mathematical point of view, this is a function, right? And you are imposing a constraint, just a sort of point-wise constraint on this function. So it's just an example of, uh, uh, of course, of constraint. Uh, this is a, another example. Uh, you see, suppose you are given some, yeah, suppose you are given some rules. These are um, rules from medicine, okay? And uh, they are essentially proposition, right? They are proposition because you say that, uh, you know, typical uh, rules that uh, uh, you may use for diagnosis. You have intervals of variables and then uh, uh, you have constraints on the decisions, right? Uh, well, you see uh, different formalism, but are constraints. This is yet another example in which you propose constraints, right? Because you say, uh, well, I want re to recognize characters, but uh, you see the difference between 8 and 3 is that uh, there is a portion in which these two characters are really very different. So it could be interesting to express in a very, you know, in an explicit way this difference. And uh, in, uh, yeah. Think about, for example, uh, documents and text categorization. Uh, just consider this example here. You want to take a decision, right? You want to take a classification of a certain document. I suppose X is the representation of your document, uh, just a keyword-based representation of your document. You want to classify the document, and you could say, for example, any document which deals with, uh, suppose, uh, neural network and uh, uh, a numerical analysis, suppose this is the category numerical analysis, is a document dealing with machine learning, right? You see the implication. Anytime a document deals with uh, uh, neural networks and numerical analysis, then, you know, it's a machine learning paper. And any machine learning paper is an artificial intelligence paper, right? Well, of course, you are constraining your decision, right? Because uh, you, you, you have still to take these decisions because you have to decide what C1, C2, C3, C4 are from your data, right? Just with a sort of learning uh, process, but then you have constraints during the decision. Now, uh, this is a completely different picture. This has to do with vision, but it's an example that I like because, you know, it's a very nice example of what, uh, you know, a constraint uh, means. So, for example, uh, suppose you want to compute, uh, this is a classical problem in computer vision, you want to calculate the optical flow, so the velocity of the pixels, right? So suppose I'm moving, I'm moving my finger now, right? Uh, look at my nail, okay? So if you look at my nail, uh, well, if you want to impose a constraint, you could say that uh, the brightness of my nail doesn't change uh, as you move uh, the nail, okay? Well, this is a good approximation in this room. Of course, if I get close to this lamp, you know, things are changing a little bit, but it's a good approximation. So the, the brightness uh, doesn't change. Well, uh, from this condition that the, bright, the brightness doesn't change, this is a classical uh, equation which is deriving computer vision. It's a constraint on the, at the end of the day uh, for computing the velocity. And, of course, it, there are so many examples uh, that has to do with constraints. But, of course, uh, you have to uh, determine to discover a language for unifying uh, all those problems. And there is, for sure, a big problem, which is shown in this picture, when you want to talk about learning and relational logic, and when, for example, the constraints has to do with logic, like the example I 
gave you on document classification. Because typically, you know, in artificial intelligence, we have two schools of thought. Uh, we are people, you know, who are very strong in formal logic, you know, who are, uh, have a lot of background in uh, knowledge representation, in formal, uh, you know, in reasoning, in automatic reasoning. And then, you know, there are people with strong background in optimization and statistics, which typically, you know, are, uh, you know, are pushing toward machine learning. But the, those uh, people, uh, typically don't communicate so much. And I think this is a problem. So let me give you, in this slide, I, I want to show you that uh, maybe you are aware of uh, uh, somebody here in this room, maybe uh, well aware of uh, what T norm are and uh, you know, their impact in fuzzy uh, systems. But if you are not, uh, uh, please uh, have a look at this slide because I think it's pretty important in order to understand you know, how we can unify, uh, you know, the discrete setting of computation, I mean, typical symbolic representation and real valued representation. So once again, take a logic formula like this, and uh, uh, you see a formula like this can be rewritten uh, in uh, using a real valued uh, uh, formula. So you see, here you have logic variable a and b, and whenever the, uh, the end of A and B is true, you know, you have the implication. So A and B imply C. Look at, you know, the corresponding formula, real valued formula. You see, whenever uh, this value is close to 1 and this value is close to 1, can you guess when the constraint is verified? Pretty simple, you know. This is 0 if and only if Fc is close to 1, right? So uh, this is just uh, delivering the principle of implication. If this is true and this is true, then also C is true, okay? But now you are playing with real numbers. And of course, there is a way for constructing this kind of formula. There is a very well-established theory. Uh, roughly speaking, you know, if you take a formula like this, which is ju just equivalent uh, to this one, right? Uh, you see what happened? There is a beautiful isomorphism. You take, for example, this operation, which is the end, and you replace the end with the product, right? You see here? And then you take the knot, and you replace the knot in this way, 1 minus. And then you impose, in order to say that this formula is true, you have to say that all this stuff is, is equal to 1. And then you end up in this equation, right? And this is nice because, uh, you know, you can start from uh, first order logic, for example, and you can rewrite the formula using uh, real valued functions. Well, this is just a way of uh, converting, uh, you know, this formula. There are many other ways, but, you know, uh, uh, one is enough. So in this uh, slide here, I'm just making a, a general picture of what a constraint could be. At the end of the day, you see, a constraint is just a function, you see, uh, phi of task uh, f of x. Go back here, you see, you have, uh, this is an example of constraint, you see, you have some functions here, look at the functions, f, a, b, and c, and then you have a formula, this is phi, uh, what I uh, denote by phi, this is the formula telling you that, uh, you know, uh, you are satisfying a certain constraint. So in order to, expre to express a sort of, uh, you know, a knowledge about uh, a certain problem, okay, you have a formula, and this formula is a constraint. And constraints, you may have many different kinds of constraints. Um, so, well, uh, I don't want to be boring about this possibility, but, you know, uh, this classification, this taxonomy, but essentially, you know, you have uh, this kind of uh, uh, constraints, so they are functions, phi, uh, which, you know, uh, are uh, simply expressing uh, a certain rule, uh, roughly speaking. And of course, you may have even uh, other notion of constraint. This is more, uh, look at this, the difference between this kind of constraint and this kind of constraint. This is uh, local, you know, it, it holds for any x, whereas here does involve directly the function f. It's a sort of, uh, you know, global constraint. And then could be uh, unilateral or could be bilateral. You see, uh, this is the meaning of uh, uh, bilateral, 
okay? And this is the meaning of uh, unilateral. Okay, but uh, um, regardless of this kind of uh, taxonomy, uh, well, you can actually find, uh, a, yes, uh, a number of uh, different cases uh, uh, here. Uh, for example, uh, here I call point-wise constraint. Those constraints were, you know, that uh, are only defined on points. You see the difference in principle? Uh, look at, uh, at an equation like this. This is a constraint which holds for any x. Any x means any, suppose in pattern recognition, it uh, means any, any, any pattern, right? Okay, so, um, so what is learning from constraint, from given constraint? Oh, look at this. This is important. Learning from given constraint. I'm assuming that somebody is providing the constraint, which is, you know, sometimes is nice, but it's not always the case in many concrete problems. Um, so there is a sort of different protocol with respect to uh, learning, what we know about learning, uh, because, you know, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a matter of communication, right? Uh, you, you want somebody uh, to learn, but the, the big difference with respect to nowadays uh, popular scheme of machine learning is that uh, we are imposing, we are asking the satisfaction of, of constraints, right? Okay, so uh, look at the classical way uh, we impose learning nowadays. Everybody here, I guess, know what supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning is. Now, that's the new protocol, right? You are given an input here, okay? Suppose this is a document, a textual document, and this is its representation into the computer. Uh, you know probably the TF, IDF representation in information retrieval, the, uh, you know, the keyword-based representation in information retrieval. So given the input, given the document, you, you have, you see here, you have a function, and this function performs classification, right? This could be a classification. And then uh, you have a number of constraints on, on, on those tasks, okay? And so that's the big difference. The big difference here is that, uh, you know, the protocol of communication with the learning agent is that somebody is offering constraints, right? Uh, I'm not saying, uh, you know, I'm not providing a positive and negative example for supervision. I'm providing a collection of formula that are constraints on the problem, okay? Here is uh, an example. Look at this. Uh, suppose you want to uh, make uh, some classification. You may have some formula here. You see, these are formula. And uh, this is the corresponding translation into real valued equations, right? So these are, they, this could be documents or even sentences, brief portion of a document, and you may be interested in classifying uh, the content, right? And you see, these are uh, functions that make predictions, okay? But you see, the big difference is that I'm not providing uh, in principle, only collection of examples for supervising what is a mammal, right? On what is an ungulate, or what is, uh, you know, uh, uh, black uh, uh, stripes, right? Or what is a zebra? Well, uh, what I'm providing are formula uh, which connect all those functions. So that's the big difference, right? Because uh, somebody uh, need to provide this information and uh, then you start to learn, but you have to learn coherently with this kind of constraints. So at the end of the day, it's, it's still the same framework of machine learning because you still need to develop function f, but the big difference is that uh, the protocol of communication is different because somebody is, is enforcing some constraints, okay? And these are examples. So here, somebody knows uh, some uh, logic formula and uh, is enforcing uh, this kind of constraint. So if you look at this picture, you see that uh, also what could be the basic idea for learning. So essentially, you are given uh, two ingredients. One, uh, one ingredient is the constraints. 
So somebody need to uh, provide this information, right? And the other ingredient is that you want to develop uh, uh, a solution. So you want to learn uh, these functions here. You see, these are the functions that you want to learn. But uh, you want to learn this function uh, according to uh, a sort of parsimony principle, a typical approach of machine learning. So you want to have, for example, smooth solutions. But you see, uh, uh, we can construct from the constraints uh, penalty functions uh, immediately. Because if you look at these uh, uh, functions, uh, well, essentially, they are already penalties. Because they are zero, right? Only provided that uh, uh, you discover the right solution. Otherwise, they are positive. So they are already penalty functions. Just like the quadratic error in supervised learning, okay, or, or the loss, uh, the typical loss functions in supervised learning. So that's the basic idea. Uh, the new penalties, oh sorry about that, yeah. The new penalties, okay, are just the penalties that uh, arise because of the constraints, okay. So, how can we, uh, at the end of the day, uh, invent a mechanism for learning? Well, in this picture you see that uh, you may have a couple of possibilities. You see, one possibility is that uh, uh, you, you think of F as a neural network, so you, uh, you, st you, you stay in, in machine learning, we say, in the primal space, and essentially what you do is that you learn neural networks uh, to satisfy these this, this constraints, you see? Because at the end of the day, these are functions that depend on uh, weights, and then you have to learn, uh, you know, uh, neural networks which respect this kind of penalties. Or alternatively, you might use kernel machine, for example. So essentially, you work in the dual space, but you have parametric functions, and, you know, the learning problem is the one of... Uh, discovering the parameters, right? Because uh, you, you offer, you, you say that there is a parametric representation and you say, well, I like uh, uh, a, a neural network representation. And particularly since they are so uh, fashionable nowadays, I like uh, deep learning, okay? Deep architectures. Or you, you may like, uh, you know, kernel machines. Now, in the, in the next uh, few minutes, I want to tell you something about this choice. Uh, once you become curious about, uh, you know, uh, what learning is, and once you say that learning is constant satisfaction, okay, so the environment is forcing you to satisfy constraints, you may be curious to understand more about this issue. Why? Simply because here somebody is giving you, uh, you know, the neural network or a kernel machine, but you may be suspicious about this decision, right? Because you could say, well, in principle, it could be very nice uh, if I could discover those functions here, uh, you know, in, from a functional point of view. I mean, uh, I don't want to provide a sort of prior on the structure of these functions. I want to see what is the best function, and I want to study in a functional space. I want to pick up the solution, not from a neural network or from a kernel machine. I want to pick up the solution from the class of, you know, functions uh, that maybe belong to a Sobol space, right? So from a, a, from a mathematical point of view, it means that uh, you are working in a, in a much uh, free space, right? You don't make so many commitments, so many assumptions. So, uh, well, if you use this idea, I'll be very, uh, you know, uh, quick on, the, on this uh, concept, but I think it's nice to understand. So this is just to show, uh, you know, how the problem can be formulated. Uh, it can be formulated using variational principles. So, so what is parsimony? Uh, parsimony, uh, for everybody who is uh, familiar with kernel machine, you know, uh, there is a classical way for expressing parsimony. But in this framework, uh, we can do something similar. You could say, well, uh, a parsimonious solution is one in which, uh, sorry, what you see here is, look at this function, right? You introduce a sort of norm of this function. You say, you know, that uh, the norm is big, provided that uh, the function, look at this picture, uh, you know, has uh, 
a very, you know, a lot of uh, peaks, right? A lot of variation. So the derivative here becomes pretty big, whereas if you look at the green function, you know, this is smooth. And uh, it's just a way of measuring, you know, the, the regularity and, and uh, you know, expressing the, the Occam uh, razor principle, okay? Well, in general, th this can be uh, generalized. I, I, I want to be quick on this issue, but uh, I want to just to give you uh, a few ideas ab about this uh, study. I, will, I become curious for, of understanding, you know, what, what is the general solution. And there is a very interesting general solution that can be expressed uh, 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 yeah, first of all, this is the formulation of the problem. You see, the formulation of learning can be expressed in a very uh, clear way because you are looking for the solution. You see, F star is the solution, is the argument of the minimum of what? Of the norm of the function provided that this function, you know, uh, is respecting the constraints. So at the end of the day, the solution is I want to discover the best function which satisfies the, so the constraints. And best means in terms of norm. So a smooth function, a smooth solution, once you give me a certain number of constraints. So let me uh, show you what is the result. Uh, there is, a, you know, the, the variational calculus offers you a, a nice uh, perspective because uh, it can tell you what is the solution. So let me let me show you the, the solution because for people who is familiar of kernel, on kernel machine, you know there is some interesting result, and the result is that uh, go directly to this expression. Uh, there is a sort of representation theorem which is very similar to the representation theorem of kernel machine. You see, the solution is the following one: the function, the uh, you know the unknown. Uh, can be expressed in this way. Uh, you see, G here is essentially uh, a kernel. What is, you know, it's very similar to the, to the kernel. And interestingly enough, this is a differential operator. So it is expressing the, the smoothness of the solution. So you see here, the solution comes from the marriage of, do, of two terms. One is a kernel, which is telling you uh, uh, you know, how smooth the solution is. And you see the other one is what I call the reaction of the constraint. And the reaction of the constraint can be computed, you know, uh, from uh, a, a general, uh, you know, it's essentially a Lagrangian multiplier. For people who is uh, familiar with Lagrangian multipliers, it's essentially a Lagrangian multiplier. The only point is that here the Lagrangian multiplier is, a, is in, you know, in a functional space. But if you look at what the reaction of the constraint is, you see the reaction of the constraint is proportional to the Lagrangian multiplier and to the gradient of the constraint. You see the gradient with respect to f of the constraint. So, you know, there is a theory for understanding what is the optimal solution, okay? Uh, let me show you quickly that, uh, for example, in the case of uh, uh, kernel machines, so for example, sorry, not in the case of kernel machine, the case of supervised learning, if you only are given constraints that are, uh, you know, uh, Dirac delta, so essentially uh, uh, supervised uh, constraints, uh, the general representation th uh, theorem that I, I show you uh, becomes the representation theorem of kernel machine. So this means that, uh, you know, it's a message which is uh, uh, interesting because it's telling you that uh, kernel machines uh, is the, actually the best solution whenever you only interact with the protocol of supervised learning. There is nothing best once you accept the principle that you have to offer a solution in terms of uh, regularization, uh, okay? Of course, the problem, everybody who is familiar with kernel machine knows that the problem has to do with the choice of the kernel, right? Uh, which, which means the, the degree of regularization that you want. But uh, uh, this is just to show you that uh, uh, the theory can be extended also to the case of constraints. Okay, so let me go quickly now uh, to show a few uh, examples of applications. So here is a list of uh, uh, problems that you have to, uh, that we consider it. But let me go quickly at least to select uh, uh, a few of them. Um, well, essentially, you see what we do. Uh, from a concrete point of view, we need to compute the reaction of the constraint. So the theory 
give you the, uh, you know, all the formalism, all the support for calculating the reaction of the constraint. In the case of kernel machine, uh, you know, the reaction of the constraint can be computed in a very simple way. In, when, once you have general constraints, well, it's more involved, but uh, uh, it can be done sometimes. So let me uh, show you quickly an example, uh, a couple of examples maybe. Well, this maybe uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, maybe this picture is better uh, for understanding. Yes, look at this. Suppose uh, you are giving a sort of uh, Gaussian kernel, okay? And suppose that uh, you want to learn a concept uh, in an interval. So in, an interval means that uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, providing, let's say, a few examples, uh, typical supervised protocol that you use uh, uh, in supervised learning, you want to impose that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, a certain function is active in an interval, right? So you know that it is active not in, on one point, right? But on an interval, okay? So which means that you know much more because you know uh, some rule. Well, in this case, the theory suggests to you that instead of using, sorry, yeah, this kind of kernel, yeah, instead of using this original uh, uh, Gaussian kernel, well, it tells you how to construct the appropriate kernel which exactly, you know, solve this problem. And, you know, these are good messages. So if you look at this picture, you can see the difference uh, in some artificial experiment that we have done. Uh, you see here is with uh, learning using only point. You see, we have two classes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, red and blue, and you see uh, the meaning of this rectangle is the following. Uh, we also know, in addition to the supervised points, that in instead, uh, you know, okay, so look at this. Inside this uh, red uh, rectangle, what we know is the category is red. And in inside this uh, blue rectangle, the category is blue, okay? So they are uh, remarkable granule of information with respect to single points. So if you learn from point only, you get something like this. If you learn from, uh, you know, boxes only, from only this rectangle, you get something like this. We can, you know, uh, learn from uh, point and box and you get something like this. You know, uh, the difference between these two pictures depends on the different regularization parameters. But just to tell you that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can uh, attack problems in which uh, we are expressing constraints that are richer than single points. Here, you know, uh, you are saying that uh, inside this rectangle, the category is uh, red. Okay, so let me uh, show you another example. Uh, this is completely different. It has to do with logic, uh, essentially. Suppose you want to classify points, right? And you want to do something like this. You have two dimensions, okay? Two dimensions, and you have uh, this category here, A, B, and C. So you see circle, and then you have triangle, and then you have uh, this box, this, uh, uh, okay, this box here, okay? So you see, uh, and then of course, you're given a, a collection of data and you want to make induction. Like, I want to know what is the category of this point here. Of course, you can use a supervised learning uh, in two dimensions, but suppose that uh, you also know something more about this problem. And you know the following, uh, you know the following rules. The rule is that whenever A and B is true, also C is true. You see? So you, need, you know also this formula. And you know also this other formula, A or B or C. What is the meaning? The meaning is that, uh, look at the picture, if A and B are true, you see? A and B are true, you see what it means? A, this is A, this is A, this is B, okay, this is B. So A and B is just here. Right? If A and B is true, also C is true. And C is all this box. Okay? So in, in a single formula, you are providing a lot of information. Okay? So in machine learning, we typically do something like this. You say, okay, this is a triangle. 
uh, and the category is C. And this is a circle. The category is A. But here, by using a single formula, you are providing a lot of information. Because you, know, you are expressing uh, a, a property which uh, you know, holds for infinite point. Okay? And look at the, another formula. For example, this one is telling you that uh, A or B or C, which means that uh, you know, all the possibilities uh, for the points is that uh, you know, they come uh, in this, uh, either in A or in B or in C. There are no point here. There are no point here, right? So it's very important. You know, it's an important piece of information. So the, uh, the, the theory makes it possible uh, to work uh, uh, jointly with points and this kind of, uh, uh, yeah, this kind of formula. So look at, at this picture. In this picture, you can see, uh, you know, uh, well, how it works in terms of uh, classification. Uh, look at what happened, for example, if you use uh, learning from example only. And what happens if you, uh, on the opposite, uh, use also logic? You see, this is class A, B, and C. You see the differences? Well, uh, as you, you can imagine, uh, they, of course, are remarkable simply because you are providing a lot of information that uh, you don't have in this case. And, you know, this is typical in, in many other cases. Le let me skip uh, uh, these slides. I think we can, yeah. Let me go quickly uh, to show you uh, something that uh, I really like, is the idea that uh, uh, you know, once you learn uh, from constraints, you can learn from constraints, but you can also check new constraints, new formula. Um, look, for example, uh, this picture here. You have formula, okay? So you see this formula, and you may be interested in uh, uh, in, oh, sorry. Yeah, you may be interested in knowing in knowing something about uh, uh, you know the uh, possible deduction. Uh, for example, uh, what you can uh, try to understand is whether this formula here, a1 and a3 implies a2, uh, if this formula is true. Okay, so this is typical in logic, right? You are given some premises and you want to see whether a certain conclusion is true. Okay, typical in logic. Well, okay, uh, so uh, what is the difference here? Well, look at, at a very important difference. Uh, the difference is that, uh, well, yes, we want to do something similar. Given this formula, we want to see whether, you know, this. Uh, deduction, this conclusion can be drawn from these premises, but there is something new here, and I know that uh, A1, A2, and A3, uh, you know, in this concrete problem, uh, are not free to chase any to choose any value. Okay, so in logic, uh, all these variables here can take any uh, any Boolean value. Okay. So this is one of the problems with logic, you know. Inferential problems in logic typically, uh, you know, are expensive from a computational point of view simply because you have an explosion in all possible, you know, uh, uh, combination of uh, variables. And you have to consider the Boolean hypercube in order to see whether a certain conclusion is true, okay? Now, look at what happened here. Uh, well, in this case, you know that uh, just think about you know A1, A2, and A3 as the categories of documents, right? Now we are in touch with the environment. That's the big difference with the typical logic reasoning. Uh, you see, we are assuming that uh, those categories A1, A2, and A3 are not just abstract logic categories. They are strongly connected with the environment. I mean, these categories, you know, can be induced also because uh, of, uh, you know, these two variables, these two fixtures, x1 and x2. So in principle, the opposite way of reasoning uh, with respect to logic is to use machine learning, right? In machine learning, supervised learning, you could say, well, please be, give me a collection of supervised points for A, for 
for A1, for A2, and for A3. You give me the supervised examples, and I will do my best for learning, you know, these categories. And of course, you know that uh, there is the cars of dimensionality. If you are a really uh, challenging problem, uh, well, Google doesn't help. And that's one interesting thing. Uh, fortunately enough, you know, uh, for us who are interested in this uh, uh, so beautiful field, uh, science and nature is offering something that, uh, uh, you know, cannot be attacked uh, with the power of uh, computers. Uh, I really like, you know, to see this uh, involvement uh, with big computational resources, but big computational resources are nothing with respect to most interesting problems that we see nowadays. This is not to, uh, you know, uh, to decrease the importance of, uh, you know, all this emphasis on computational resources. Computational resources are just fantastic. But, you know, if you are dealing with some challenging problem, right, in which you have a huge collection of documents, in which you want to uh, come up with a sort of semantic representation, in which you have huge collection of uh, formula, well, that's the time in which deep learning doesn't help. That's the time in which, you know, all those in, uh, computers doesn't help at all. And the reason is simple, because, uh, you know, the space becomes so huge that uh, it is uh, simply impossible, you know, to come up with this kind of borders, uh, with the uh, inferential mechanism uh, of uh, deep learning, uh, at least in very, very challenging problems. Of course, it doesn't mean that, uh, well, of course, it depends on the, on the kind of problem that you are uh, facing, but uh, the same all for logic. Even with logic, we know very well that uh, if the number of variables, you know, are pretty big, well, you get in trouble because the inferential mechanism with logic, you know, are very heavy. Well, uh, if you uh, are interested in uh, some inferential mechanism where, you know, yes, you are playing with logic, but you, are, you see the big difference is that those formula here are based on categories, you know, which are not randomly distributed, you know, are not making any uh, possible choice of uh, A1, A2, and A3. Because of the statistical distribution, right, those categories, uh, you know, are quite related and they have a sort of distribution. So from a pure uh, logic point of view, uh, we can easily see that this derivation is false. But if you want to see uh, what happened in this environment where, you know, there is a restriction on the uh, domain, well, in this case it is true because uh, whenever A1 and A3 are true, you see, whenever A1 and A3 are true, A2 is, tr is true as well, right? Whereas if you uh, make an interpretation, a, a pure logic interpretation, well, this is not true uh, anymore. And I think this is very interesting because it is opening to a new way of performing inference, which is the inference in the environment. I mean, you, you are interested in making inference, but this time you don't want to explore the Boolean hypercube because you are not interested in the Boolean hypercube, simply because you know in advance that most of those configurations will never happen uh, in reality, simply because those data, you know, are still uh, depending also on features. Okay, so uh, let me, well, here is just a, a table to show uh, that then we can perform, uh, you know, experiment and, and uh, you know, see uh, with this mechanism uh, which formula are true or false. But, uh, you know, I want to conclude my talk uh, in a few minutes with what I, uh, at the end of, of this analysis, you know, which started maybe uh, five years ago and maybe more, you know, I think it's more interesting, at least to me. Um, well, let me tell you what I learned uh, from this story. Well, I was, you know, quite happy about these results, but not so, uh, you know, excited. I can tell you that at the end of the day, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, this theory, uh, well, uh, make it possible to uh, find some beautiful, uh, well, so to understand some beautiful uh, notion that uh, you typically don't see when you learn from supervised example. Uh, there is uh, this interesting challenge of uh, uh, getting in touch with logic, but let me tell you what is really uh, not very satisfactory. Well, 
There is something which is not satisfactory to me, and is that, yeah, okay, this is satisfactory because examples are just constrained. This is satisfactory because, uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, there is no need to distinguish between uh, perception and logic anymore. Uh, we can frame everything in the same uh, uh, theory, but there is something that I really don't like. And I can tell you wh that what I don't like is that uh, uh, we are missing the crucial role of time in learning. Uh, but before telling you that, uh, well, you could say, why should be so important? Well, let me tell you, uh, tell you something concrete. Uh, first of all, so far, I show you learning uh, of, uh, sorry, from constraint. What if you are also interested in learning constraints, right? So here, this point is completely missed. Because you, uh, in this theory, you need somebody who provides constraints. But in many real problems, you don't even know what constraints are, okay? And even if you know the constraints, what I can tell you that uh, is, uh, at the end of the day, there is some remarkable problem in this approach. And the problem is that uh, you can easily understand that once you start to involve complex constraints, those, problem, uh, those problems become, uh, you know, early very complicated in terms of optimization. And this is very nice, you know, because it seems that, uh, uh, yeah, from one side uh, the theory is clean, you can formulate everything, but the reverse of the coin is that, uh, you know, the optimization problem becomes very, very complex. And this is, of course, very bad and, and complex in my understanding, not because, you know, with my resources. They become complex even with, uh, you know, remarkable resources, even with the Google resources. And so this is pretty bad because, uh, you know, you can, well, uh, I was wondering, you know, what, what could be the reason for that? Because in a sense, right, uh, even if the, the theory, uh, I like the theory, is clean, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't give you so much. Well, uh, in, a, in, in a couple of slides, I, I want to tell you uh, what a, you know, I think is important uh, and is missing in this theory. What is really important is uh, the crucial role of time. So I'm still in the context in which, uh, you know, I cancel the idea that uh, uh, there is supervised learning, there is unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning. I say, well, I need another uh, interaction with the environment, okay? But we are still in the same context in which we are assuming that somebody will, uh, you know, comes in front of the learning agent uh, uh, with a, a huge track of data, full of data, you know, the track downloads the data, the agent takes all this, you know, uh, big amount of data and try and do its best for learning, right? In my understanding, there is something really wrong in this way of working. And I have the impression that it's really wrong. And we have to, uh, you know, uh, as soon as possible uh, to escape uh, this way of, uh, of working. And the reason why, you know, this is wrong, uh, after uh, years of this, you know, formalism, at least it seems to me very clear. Because, you know, from one side you get a beautiful theoretical picture of, you know, how you can solve the problem. But, you know, the reverse of the coin is that the problem is so complicated that you, can, you cannot solve the problem, at least at, la at large scale. And my feeling is that we are really missing the time. The, 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 and time, what is the meaning uh, of missing the time? Well, the meaning, uh, well, I, I did some, you know, in, in case you want to uh, read something, preliminary at least, uh, there are a couple of papers uh, that you can uh, uh, read in which, uh, in this paper, you know, uh, for, uh, we, we did our best for uh, uh, delivering, and you know, the idea that, uh, uh, learning should be very similar to, you know, what happened in, uh, in children, not because we intend to emulate, you know, the biology of children, not because uh, it, it is, uh, let's say, um, yes, it is uh, uh, plausible, should be plausible from a cognitive point of view, but for another reason, from a computational point of view. And uh, so we started to analyze the idea of learning uh, uh, like children, 
But uh, uh, learning, uh, you know, to see like children uh, is something that uh, uh, you can read in this paper, something in which we deliver a, a few preliminary ideas, and something in which uh, you also see some of the preliminary ideas on uh, uh, what could be the meaning of uh, learning by incorporating the time is in this paper which appeared last year in Theoretical Computer Science, um, which is based on a sort of interpretation of uh, learning as something that has to obey, uh, let's say, laws of computation. So essentially, in this paper, what we try to do is to formulate learning just as a sort of uh, law of nature in which time uh, really plays uh, its own role. And instead of, uh, you know, uh, taking the challenge of uh, learning from a huge collection of data, you start thinking that maybe it's much better if your agent start living in the environment and you provide some clever mechanism for adapting continuously to the environment. In a sense, you know, you could say nothing new because online learning is something that uh, we you know, has already been uh, considered for, for years and years. But, uh, uh, well, uh, if you start uh, uh, thinking carefully about uh, what online learning is in most cases, you will realize that online learning is simply a sort of, uh, let's say, alternative interpretation of batch mode learning. Looks like the ideal model uh, the theoretically correct model for many people is batch mode learning, right? So the idea that you learn from a huge collection of data, and then if you, you want to if you want to perform a good approximation, then you have online learning. Please consider that uh, you don't be confused. This is not involving time in the learning process. It's something different. You are simply uh, using a, a different, uh, you know, uh, iteration mechanism for learning, but it's not involving time uh, in the uh, mechanism of learning. Uh, so essentially what we need to do is to uh, uh, attack what I call the edge, uh, uh, the egg chicken dilemma in, in many uh, machine learning problems. Vision is for sure one interesting example, natural language, Processing is another example, you know, and uh, it seems to me that the only way for breaking this problem is to, to have the possibility of uh, agents which perform a sort of developmental learning, uh, right, day by day, uh, starting from scratch, just like children. And this, in my understanding, is not a matter of, uh, uh, you know, emulating uh, children. It's not a matter of biology. On the opposite, I do believe that it's a computational issue uh, to which biology has to obey as well. So this is the last slide. And the last slide is that, uh, you know, is uh, making the suggestion that uh, we can escape uh, this uh, edge chicken dilemma exactly uh, by developmental learning. And, uh, you know, cognitive laws, uh, in my understanding, can be discovered just, uh, you know, while living. And, uh, you know, the constraints can be learned. That's the principle. I, I would like to learn the constraint, just like the task, okay, at the same time. So if you look at this equation, you know, uh, in this talk, I, uh, you know, I, I did my best to convince you that uh, we can learn once the constraints are given, right? And then once the constraints are given, we have a new protocol for learning function f, right? Now, what if we learn all together constraints and uh, uh, function f? Uh, in my understanding, you know, once uh, uh, we start to uh, understand what is the meaning of learning, uh, also the constraint, well, uh, we should be close to something uh, much more interesting. Uh, but of course, what we need is written here in red, is that we need new representations of the parsimony principle. So, for example, what is a beautiful formula here? What is a beautiful constraint? So, how should I, uh, you know, uh, make suggestions about what is a, a good constraint? Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Marco. Thank Thanks, Marco. 
Um, we have time for questions. Um, I will grab another microphone. And since we're recording this, it would be great if you can ask your questions into a microphone. So any questions? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question for the last part that it's, um, you talked about natural learning involves time. Uh, it's really interesting uh, that um, until now some, something that humans are good at and machine learning still struggles is to completely change the, uh, the learning or the strategy that they applied until now for a new example. So I don't know, uh, we, we see a game, uh, we apply a certain strategy to play and then uh, a machine uh, repeats that. But if we see another player that um, plays differently and wins much more uh, easily, we quickly adapt and change our strategy too. Uh, and maybe learning from constraints, and this can uh, give an advantage, uh, adding some, some constraints on the spot, or, or it differs? Yeah, OK. Well, uh, the case of, of uh, you know, in which an agent, uh, um, for example, is involved in, in a game, and uh, what you said concerning the adaptation to uh, new strategies, for example, simply because you see uh, that somebody uh, is capable of uh, uh, is offering a, a better strategy, is uh, uh, from yeah. Of course, from one side, uh, it's true that l l when I told you I was excited uh, about the, the possibility of the theory of attacking more or less any problem. Yeah, this is true, but uh, if you just consider your example, uh, it's exactly one uh, example in which you see that uh, the learning mechanism uh, in many cases uh, do rely on uh, also on a sort of temporal structure. Um, and uh, 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 so to be honest, at the moment, uh, you know, a complex problem cannot be attack by this theory and, and uh, in problems like the one you are mentioning in which you are considering very uh, sophisticated human strategies in which you see uh, you know uh, pe people observing the evolution of strategies and they can pick up uh, the most appropriate strategies is just an example uh, in any case of the importance of uh, you know learning uh, in the environment and uh, uh, there is no uh, possibility, uh, I think, of replacing this with what we have done so far in machine learning, which is essentially, regardless of you know, how big your computational resources are, uh, to use still the same uniform idea. Uh, in computer vision, uh, ImageNet, uh, I guess there are a number of people who know what ImageNet is, is something great, very big, actually. But could you say that ImageNet is meaningful in terms of vision. Well, uh, I uh, well I honestly believe that is not reason is nothing with respect to the the complexity of information that we have in vision, and and I think that there is no benchmark, no data set which can uh, uh, somehow uh, model properly what vision is, and the same for for language. Uh, the same for language. And, and the example that you pose is one in which you see, you know, how important on the opposite is, uh, you know, uh, the way we humans experiment uh, of learning, which is uh, in no way is a sort of, uh, you know, collection, huge, huge collection of data that you start to process, uh, you know, uh, uh, without any developmental uh, idea. And, and so my, my final comment is, what if, sometimes I'm, I'm puzzled about, you know, what happened, for example, in vision, right? And not only in vision, in, in many pro problem or cognition. You know, nature seems to, to do something interesting. Like, for example, in vision, it's very well known that, uh, uh, you know, children in the early uh, stage of life, they have a sort of blurring of the image, right? You may wonder that this is a sort of biological uh, solution, right? But I do believe that, uh, 
you know, there is one of the secrets of solution for uh, vision and uh, maybe in language there are something similar, there are similar solutions. So the, the information flooding, the huge amount of data that we have with our machine learning algorithms is part of the problem. We are offering, we computer scientists are offering machine a problem which is much more difficult that uh, you know, uh, can be uh, offered in nature. When I say it's much more difficult, I say that uh, you know, we construct a huge training set and we say, okay, now you have to learn uh, from this huge training set. Uh, and and uh, whereas, you know, for, for humans, uh, the, the, the task, the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, uh, the kind of target that humans have is not exactly the target that we expect the machine to have. So who he, here, nobody is expecting, suppose there is a, you know, a, uh, a boy of uh, let's say 10 years old and comes and uh, start understanding this talk okay uh, nature is fantastic from this point of view because uh, you know a very smart boy will stay here for my guess is 30 seconds maybe one minute and this is great it is what is saving his time and his computational capabilities suppose you are forcing the boy to stay here just like we are forcing our uh, learning algorithm to drink this huge collection of data. That's a problem. And that, that's where the problem in machine learning is. That's my failure in the last uh, uh, five years, I think. So I have, a, I have a question. I didn't understand the last two sentences. What, what is your failure? <laughs> Three sentences? I, I didn't understand the very end where you said this is what my failure is. is in the, the, well, failure the, the because I, I did I did the same actually. I, uh, at the end, you know, the theory of learning from constraint is still based on the idea that you give me data, right? Well, it's not uh, supervised learning, uh, and that's beautiful. I like this. You know, it's not supervising uh, supervised learning because if you have to satisfy a constraint. Suppose, uh, just to be a very, uh, you know, in a very simple example, suppose that the constraint is based on two functions, right? And you are imposing that the sum of this function is equal to, right? Well, even if you don't have any supervision, that's a beautiful uh, constraint. It's a beautiful penalty because you are imposing, uh, you take your data, your huge collection of data, and you try to enforce the constraint, right? And this is what I've done with huge collection of data. So this is beautiful from one side, but the problem is still the one uh, connected to his question and to many very challenging uh, machine learning tasks. The problem is that uh, uh, we need an approach which naturally incorporates time, the way we learn, but not because I want to emulate humans simply because I'm confident that from a pure computational point of view, it is the only possibility of attacking complex problems. As I said, in vision, for example, the reason why nature is blurring, in my understanding, is to say from information, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, floating, right? Because uh, it's like the boy I say, uh, I was thinking about, right? Uh, the boy I was thinking about, you know, is saving his time because it has a beautiful focus and attention mechanism. Maybe he's curious, but after a few seconds, 30 seconds, you know, will escape this room. And, and this is important for any learning system. Thanks. Yeah. Um. I hope you don't mind, but could you go back to the example of the three classes that you were talking about, uh, where you try to learn the inference or you al evaluated those inferences? Oh, so let, let me help you to understand uh, for inferences. Uh, no, this next one. slide. This next one. slide. Yes, that one. Okay. Um, what I understand here is you looped through all the possible combinations of constraints to try to learn them and evaluated the probability of success over here. Is that right? Well, essentially what we try, uh, you see they, these are candidate constraints, right? So uh, it's like to say you learn from uh, a certain uh, collection of, uh, of uh, formula and then what you do uh, later on is that you want to see whether, you know, uh, 
they are true. For example, this is the knowledge base. Okay, so these three formulas are given. Okay, so you are given this one, this one, and this one. Okay, and then what you want to do is that you want to establish whether you know the remaining formula are true. Right. And uh, so how can you check? Actually, uh, sorry, uh, I didn't say uh, how this can be done. And maybe it's also part of the question, but uh, this can be done simply because uh, suppose you take this formula here, uh, this is translated into a real value constraint, and then what you have is a sort of penalty, and you can take the penalty and accumulate the error over the training set. Okay? Well, now, uh, of course, this is expensive because you have to make all the uh, accumulation over all the training set. Uh, or, or your data, but please consider that if you compare with uh, you know problem of automatic typical problem of automatic reasoning in which you had the typical uh, uh, exponential explosion, here you don't have any exponential explosion. Okay, and simply because you may uh, uh, you may need to process a huge training set, but it's not uh, exponential, right? And of course. Uh, this is not as strong as logic in the sense of formal logic, because in formal logic uh, you end up with, a, uh, let's say, you end up with a, a decision and you say that this formula is true or false, right, regardless of the fact that uh, you are in a certain environment. Remember, the environment is important because uh, it is somehow uh, restricting, uh, you know, the decision on the Boolean hypercube. Instead of uh, considering all the uh, combination, uh, the environment is uh, just uh, is dramatically cutting you know, the space, the decision space. It's sort of manifold. Uh, if you think in terms of uh, uh, the real uh, uh, function, it's a manifold. So instead of being in a huge dimensional space, the decision uh, is on the manifold. And of course, this is the big advantage, and of course, it's not as strong as formal reasoning, because you know uh, it's only a sort of approximate reasoning, exactly in that environment. But I don't know whether I, I got your point. But I think uh, it was. Uh, that did did uh, I? Yeah, that answers part of my question. Okay. The other part was I wanted to know if there was. This was what you considered for a very small set of constraints. Yeah. But what if we had a much larger set? Is that what you meant by a difference between the exponential explosion? OK. Well, uh, what is interesting here is that just consider, for example, the growth of the number of literals. OK? Well, uh, once you have uh, uh, the growth of literals in logic, is bad. OK? You get in trouble. Here, in principle, you don't get in trouble because of this problem, simply because, you know, what is important here is that, you know, is the dimension, you know, how big is the, uh, the space, the perceptual space. So in a sense, uh, this is a decision which, uh, you know, is grounded to the perceptual space. So it depends on how big the perceptual space is. But interestingly enough, the perceptual uh, space has to do with life you know, well, humans and also machine. So my understanding is that many of the uh, decisions and many of the uh, cognitive mechanisms that we activate, uh, you know, are dominated from uh, uh, the complexity point of view because we don't need to uh, uh, consider all uh, the possibility of the Boolean hypercube. And if you are in a sort of manifold, you may have also a huge number of variables here, right? Suppose you have 100 uh, variables, right? which is still a you know, pretty big number for logic. And uh, uh, well, here it depends a lot you know, on uh, uh, how big is the, uh, the perceptual space, so the space uh, of your data, which typically is finite. Of course, it could be expensive, but uh, you know, from a, a, a complexity point of view, uh, uh, there is a completely different uh, way of uh, dealing with uh, 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 with, with this reasoning mechanism. Of course, they are uh, not comparable because they are approximate and uh, they can fail from the uh, formal logic point of view. But remember, in this picture, the failure was appreciated. I mean, uh, if you look at this formula here, this is not, uh, uh, you know, this conclusion here cannot be derived 
from these three premises, from the a pure logic point of view. But interestingly enough, here, uh, you know, you can draw this conclusion. So, you know, it is, uh, it is not as good as formal logic, because uh, in the formal logic point of view, but you may decide to have this kind of reasoning mechanism. Any other questions? Hey, so, <coughs> first, uh, thank you for your talk. I can tell you that uh, coming from the constraint community, it was really deeply interesting. Um, I will have a question about uh, learning constraints. I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of global constraints in uh, constraint programming. Um, I don't. Because I, I, depending I, of your answer, I, I explain a bit or not what it yeah. is. So, yeah, okay. Um, and actually, when uh, you said that you're, you are looking to uh, learn constraints, I was wondering if it is somehow um, you try to, to, to learn a kind of global constraint, not the, the same global constraints as. Uh, not the same definition in, in uh, constraint programming, but somehow maybe you are looking to, to, to learn to recognize uh, kind of recurrent constraints, something that appears often to model problems, to model your kind of problems. So I was wondering if there is a kind of connection between this kind of global constraints and learning constraints, uh, the, the way you, you are trained to do. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so th th thanks for the question because, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that I uh, knew a little bit of the, uh, yeah, of the literature in uh, 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 constrained uh, programming um, because of, uh, you know, a number of, uh, a lot of time uh, spent with people in, in our country. I don't know whether, you know, Francesca Rossi, uh, so with Francesca, you know, I, I try to, to learn something from Francesca from this point of view because uh, uh, so I know a little bit about uh, constraint programming. Uh, I can tell you uh, honestly that at the moment I don't have a clear picture on uh, how, you know, this huge uh, uh, expertise, uh, sorry, experience in the field uh, could be uh, used because I'm confident that uh, it's only a matter of ignorance because there is a huge uh, literature uh, in, uh, in, in constrained programming. And of course, uh, the language in most cases is so different that uh, you, uh, you need, uh, as usual, to be patient and you need to, uh, to talk. But I, I have the impression that that's a, a sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be a very interesting marriage, you know, to, uh, to be more patient and trying to understand uh, how uh, many of, uh, because of course many of, of the things on, uh, uh, yes, on learning constraints, uh, learning of constraints are definitely uh, uh, a, 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 an important uh, topic in, uh, in that community. Uh, now, uh, you've probably uh, got uh, one uh, specific issue here, is that at the same time, you know, we have to learn also what I call the task, right, uh, which are those functions, which typically, and that's one remarkable difference with respect to uh, what people maybe like you and Francesca Rossi are doing, you know, uh, uh, you typically, uh, or typically you play more with symbolic, only with symbolic stuff at least in, for what I, I know in most cases. Here, you know, there is uh, also the need of uh, expressing these functions, uh, typically by uh, models like neural networks or kernel machine, because there is also a perceptual space, okay? There is also a, perce a perceptual space, but uh, I think you're right, many of the problems, especially on learning the constraints, uh, could be similar. At the moment, you know, uh, what I, when I uh, uh, concluded my talk, uh, uh, I invoked this idea. So the idea that uh, uh, you should look for some uh, formula which is simple enough, and I'm confident that uh, this is nothing new, uh, but we have to introduce some uh, nice idea of what a formula, for example, a logic formula, when the formula is simple. Because uh, you may have, uh, of course, uh, many 
First of all, uh, you could say that if you want to learn constraints, one problem is the structure of constraint. Uh, whether, suppose they are ORN clauses or maybe uh, some more complex formula, right? And then uh, you have also to uh, express a sort of uh, a degree of simplicity because otherwise, you know, uh, maybe the solution is not very effective. But I, I, I confess uh, uh, this is really something that uh, um, in which I have to learn uh, concerning that community. Thank you. Hi. Um, going back to the, the boy uh, who was not very here, but uh, really here, uh, I think uh, it's pretty interesting that you say um, uh, he stays only a minute because uh, there is a limit to the curiosity he had. Um, it's boring for him because uh, he can't understand uh, the subject and, uh, and even if he tried, he can't, uh, uh, there is no value for him. And uh, have you thinking about uh, how can we um, uh, translate the concept of uh, curiosity in terms of uh, learning for matching. Sorry, the, I can translate the concept of what? The concept of uh, curiosity. Ah, curiosity. Okay, into uh, okay, uh, in in terms of uh, learning of constraints. Not uh, specially for constraint, but just learning yes. for learning machine. Learning something. Yes. yes. Uh, in yeah. a, uh, finding a function yeah. or something to minimize. That is uh, uh, something that is... Uh, yeah, uh, well, that, that's, uh, of course, a very uh, yeah, challenging issue. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, curiosity is, uh, at least in humans, is probably the most important things for learning. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I confess that uh, at the moment uh, uh, I don't have any... Uh, clear or any uh, idea of what really curiosity could be. Uh, but curiosity, uh, uh, if you really can uh, find some formal description, I'm confident that that could be important. For example, in my framework, it could be for, uh, yes, for extracting uh, the, the constraint. Well, I, I can tell you a few uh, things uh, in any case. Uh, remember my example of uh, the boy who enter the room, uh, start to listen what we are talking about, uh, and after a few minutes, uh, uh, you know, leave the room. Uh, this is not an example of uh, uh, a very pertinent and specific example of what curiosity means, because it's more a sort of uh, focus of attention, right, uh, in that case. Uh, the boy is smart enough to understand that he's losing his time. So it's something which, uh, which is somehow saving his time. And it, it is not exactly uh, 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 what uh, curiosity mean, which, uh, means, which could be uh, a little bit more uh, specific and, and also subtle. Because uh, you, you need really to have a, a mechanism which, uh, which is a positive mechanism, more than a, a sort of rejection, right? The boy says, OK, I want to exit because uh, I'm not interested anymore. Whereas curiosity is a sort of more uh, creative step in which you select something because you find it very interesting. And uh, well, maybe uh, we can uh, also uh, try to, uh, to, to think about uh, this possibility. But uh, yeah, I'm confident, uh, uh, only a, a comment about this, I'm confident I um, I know more or less like uh, anybody here about this possibility. Uh, I'm not, I, uh, but, but I think they are uh, extremely important. Uh, they are part, you know, what you say concerning curiosity or other uh, specific uh, uh, social beha human behavior. Uh, I want to reinforce the idea that in my understanding, they are not just uh, something that uh, um, has to do with, with biology. They are important for learning quickly, no matter what you know, the body of, of the learning agent is. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of like the question, and I also, also like your, your, the beginning of your answer when you said, uh, you know, what is the definition of curiosity here? Uh, it's That's certainly very important for learning. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, your, your example of this little guy coming into the room and not understanding anything of what you're talking about, uh, he concludes after a, a minute or so that, you know, I mean, I might go out uh, as well out again and do something more, more, more uh, useful with my time. And um, so the question really is, as you said, you know, what is the definition of curiosity? And I think there are two terms somewhere in there. One is, okay, I don't know, because if I only knew, I don't have to be curious about it, because I already know. But on the other side, there's a term that has to describe somehow that uh, I already know something about it, because otherwise I don't have anything to attach it to. Uh, so you know, there is no point in being curious about something that I have no idea about. I have nothing where I can start to kind of yeah. attach new things to it. So I need in this conceptual space uh, somewhere, uh, you know, on, on the cognitive side of things there in this, in this pyramid, I need to have something to attach stuff to. And if I don't, then it's, there's no point in being curious. This is what I understand from what you said. And I think this is very interesting. So, you know, there, the curiosity is not only the lack of... of of understanding, or yeah, but right. it's it's also it needs it, uh, it needs there's an obligation to have something to attach it to. So, like to say that uh, uh, is the the state in which you of course you you are somehow aware of uh, uh, a notion that could be extremely important for you, and then you can grasp if you are patient enough because that's important, but. It is extremely difficult, you know, to identify what is really important for you and uh, whether, uh, you know, it is not like the case of the boy who has to uh, leave the, uh, the room. Because, uh, as you said, it, it may, maybe you realize that you are not far away uh, from the concept and then you can grasp something really useful. Uh, yeah. Okay, there's another question. I would thank you for your presentation. I just have one question about uh, uh, learning of constraints. So how do you deal with the uh, perturbations in the data if you have? That means if you have a huge uh, number of data, you how do you recognize the uh, incorrect uh, learned constraints and correct ones? Uh, okay, so in order, I'm, it's important that when I reply to this question, uh, it's also important for all of you to know that uh, uh, maybe you, you got from what I said, uh, this is really preliminary investigation, right? Uh, so while I've done uh, some research uh, in learning from constraints, uh, learning of constraints at the moment is only uh, something that uh, I've explored, but not with the same, uh, you know, with the same effort. Uh, you know, what you, you are saying concerning perturbation and only, uh, you know, uh, the typical tricky learning environments in which we human uh, are involved, uh, it's very interesting because uh, uh, we can, in many cases, deal uh, quite easily uh, with information which, uh, in principle, seems to deliver opposite conclusions, right? And after a while, we realize, you know, what is the right direction. And, you know, uh, this is a very uh, complex uh, uh, human mechanism and uh, generally computational mechanism. Uh, you know, to understand uh, that uh, you, ha you have this information which during your life, you know, uh, changes because uh, your data maybe are not compatible uh, and they are expressing something which, uh, uh, you know, support different conclusions. Um, well, uh, I'm confident in any case that uh, uh, this uh, uh, mechanism in which you have uh, also uh, perturbation of data, something which is not coherent, uh, uh, you know, they, they, these are um, the, the idea of learning uh, in the environment, so while living instead of so conceiving mechanism that, uh, as I said, does involve time, but time not the iteration of the algorithm, 
which is really different. Please believe me, it's really another story. The iteration, just think about backprop, right? Something like online backprop. It is something which has nothing to do with time, uh, with something like, you know, I have my experience in the life, uh, I experience, uh, have some experience, and then, you know, something changes, as you said, and I have to adapt to something which changes. Uh, you know, it could be uh, apparently, you know, the, the, the models uh, of online learning are somehow in that direction, but I'm confident that uh, it's not that direction. And at the moment, you know, I don't have really an answer to questions like this. Uh, what we did uh, um, was, uh, you know, uh, if you like, you, you may have a look, maybe you, you could be uh, interested in, in this paper. In, in this paper, you know, that there is an attempt, at, uh, you know, very general to uh, think about uh, uh, cognition as uh, something which emerges from um, laws of nature, just like, you know, uh, quantum mechanics or, you know, uh, something uh, with the same idea. And the, and the idea is that there is time. Uh, this time there is also there are uh, potentials, like in physics, right? And what, what are potentials here? Are, are the environmental constraints? Because during living, you know, these agents have to interact, right? And uh, so there is really time and there, there is a sort of potential, just like in, in, in physics. And then you, you have also something similar to, uh, you know, uh, for example, in mechanics, kinetic energy, because uh, it has to do with regularity, uh, with smoothness. And, uh, you know, it is a mechanism, uh, if you start thinking in this way, uh, you really try to uh, enforce constraints during the living and, and, and we have, in this case, time. Uh, but please consider that, uh, you know, this is just a, a sort of a, a very uh, preliminary study and uh, maybe many people uh, have, have been doing something uh, similar. And uh, it's just an attempt to, uh, you know, change dramatically the way in which learning is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, formulated. Uh, exactly be because I, I believe, as I said, that uh, it is not the right formulation. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but, but I don't have the right formulation, for sure. <laughs> a, a, a rough linear regression says that, well, we might have time for another question. We don't have time for another answer. So let's thank Marco again for his presentation. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to, to, to all of you for, you know, so, my, so many questions. Thanks. Is, is there a software implementation of any of this? A uh, repository, yes. A hello just in world case. Example? Yeah. So we'll, we'll email it around for, for everybody so that we don't have to memorize things today. Yeah, yeah well, of course, you, you know, I'll be pleasing uh, people who is interested in, in any, well, you can be in touch with me. Uh, that's probably the most efficient way. You, you drop an email, I'll be extremely pleased to uh, talk with you. Uh, that's probably the, the, the most straightforward way. Yeah, for, for the software, we, we have a, well, um, we have a package, a software package for doing, you know, this learning from constraint. And, uh, uh, but if you uh, do, uh, but you, you, go, you can go there just from my web page. Uh, be, because no 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 not from my web page uh, it, it's too difficult just to just uh, uh, type learning from constraint I'm going to ask Google. you for a copy of the slides and I will email them to everybody yeah sure I'll be and that way we'll all have this okay that will be great thanks so uh, just a reminder that we'll have we, we'll have a little bit of um, um, bon je vais parler français quand même donc il y a un petit goûter en bas uh, après uh, pour ceux qui connaissent le lieu, c'est évident, mais pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas, il y a un escalier juste à l'extérieur, vous descendez au rez-de-chaussée et c'est juste là. Euh, pour le, la semaine prochaine, euh, lundi prochain, il y a encore une présentation euh, du Nantes Machine Learning Meetup. Euh, ce sera Eric Le Carpentier et Yannick Austin de l'Éco Centrale qui vont parler d'une un, main robotique et ce qu'ils ont fait avec. Euh, donc voilà. Euh, et je vous remercie. Pour les étudiants d'Epitech, de, 
je voudrais, je, enfin, merci d'être venu. Je voudrais juste vous dire que la présentation de Marco était parmi les, les plus techniques que nous avons vues. C'était super, j'en étais très content. Mais euh, ne vous désespérez pas euh, si vous n'avez pas compris le tout parce que c'était quand même assez, euh, assez poussé. Voilà. Euh, donc, merci à tous.